Allah, a chance to gain reward. I will spend on you, he says, all on who spend in good cause. Good deeds are opportunities, sparkling bright and true. Raising you in the sight of Allah and adorning Al Jannah for you. So rush to earn his reward. Don't forget the oppressed. And when you go to sleep at night. Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, was salatu was salam, ala Rasulil Kareem, wa ala alihi wa sahbi, wa man tabi'a sunnatuhu ila yomidin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome again to another episode of your weekly Islamic chat show coming to you live here from Dubai. A time to please Allah. As always, I'm your host, Ismail Bullock, and again this week, Brother Gabriel Romani is roaming around Romania still. It's quite a good one, actually, roaming around Romania. But yeah, he's not here, so we have with us no stranger to the show, Brother Nabil Aziz. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakum for having me back. So, Jazakum alaikum for coming back on as a as our guest host. It's my pleasure. We have a couple of interesting guests coming on today, actually. Yeah. Uh, so that would be nice. First timers, yeah. uh, I believe, on Huda TV and on this show, of course. Yeah. Um, they're going to be talking about trials of life, and this is actually something that we'd, or should I say, one of the one of the, one of the guests, Imam Abdul Basit, came up with this suggestion. If, if, if I remember correctly. But it's quite pertinent because we see a couple of days after that was suggested, we heard about another one of these uh, celebrity suicides. You know, whether whether it's a suicide... Uh, we, I remember even a couple of, uh, you know, a uh, couple of months ago, there was another uh, famous actor, I think it was Philip Seymour Hoffman or something, who had, a, you know, had overdosed... Uh, of heroin in his own toilet was, I believe, was found by his wife and his children. So, I mean, we've always said this in the past. You know, you see, we could go on for, we could go on for. I mean, the, unfortunately, the names are countless. Whitney Houston. I mean, we could go on for. We could probably go on if we really tried to remember all the names. There's so many of them, and this is a, quite a strong message, really, because these people have, as the saying goes, they have the world at their fingertips. You know, they have the, they have. What many people would dream of having, you know, they have unlimited, pretty much in a sense, for what they use in their life, they have unlimited money, they have the, all the cars, the boats, the private jets, everything that somebody, people aspire to get, they have it, they, they have it. So, in theory, they should be the most happiest people. Mm -hmm. And we know Robin Williams, you know, uh, committed suicide. And, uh, you know, a guy who supposed, you know, a guy who made his money making people laugh and somebody you'd think this guy must be the happiest guy and you know he's such a funny guy uh, had some very distasteful jokes but we won't go that's another long side issue but uh, you know people think this guy he's he makes people laugh so people you know you see him on screen you see him in interviews you see, this guy must be one of the happiest guys in the world and i remember hearing many years ago that he had thoughts and he said you know i struggle with you know suicidal thoughts he was a drug addict uh, again, Philip Seymour Hoffman, very respected. He wasn't, uh, you know, like one of these street guys who became an actor. He was a educated, you know, he was one of those people. If you thought of Hollywood of a civilized, uh, good social class, you know, good thinking, well respected, honorable man, you'd think of someone like Philip Seymour Hoffman, or maybe some people would even think that about, you know, Robin Williams. But they're the ones who end up, you know. Uh, with all this uh, so-called education, so-called uh, status, money, and they take their own lives. It became a it became a sunnah of the celebrities actually <laughs> that they uh, that they get all their stuff and then they get depressed and they have various psychological issues and then ultimately when they can't take it anymore, they uh, they sort of uh, end their lives. Uh, Subhanallah. It's actually very, uh, very poignant, poignant, and it's something that all, all, all of us actually should take a little bit of time to reflect on. As you said, they have absolutely everything, but they're almost, you could say, they're dead inside. 
And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about, about the believers that uh, in the remembrance of Allah, the be- believers, their hearts, uh, hearts find, find rest. And ultimately that's the only sort of, sort of refuge and tranquility that a person will have is his acknowledgement that he has some sort of internal uh, need or internal like sort of a compartment that can only be satisfied by uh, by turning to his creator and worshiping him. I mean that I you mentioned there's also an opposite to that, isn't there? You know, uh, you know, whoever turns away from my remembrance, he will have like a, a horrible life or mm. unhappy life. Subhan- you know, so we see, you know, the one Allah is telling us, uh, you know, that the hearts they truly feel content and have this real satisfaction, happiness. With the remembrance of Allah, then we have the other side say that if you turn away from the remembrance of Allah, that you will have a, a, a sad or horrible life. Mm. And in reality, like I said, you know, you'd assume. I mean, all of us we get happy if we have an, you know, we 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 have a nice house, we bought a nice car. Of course, all of us feel happy, you know, to some extent in those kind of things. But when you know, you'd assume that those people who have Everything, you know, it, whatever house they want, pretty much they can buy. Whatever car they want, they can buy. But then again, in reality, like you said, they're just very, very empty. Yeah, I think, I mean, we need to sort of really, uh, I don't know if there's been any sort of studies uh, done on that or if there's been sort of any like, sort of actual intellectual thought that's going to be behind exactly why, why all, of this, all of this stuff and this adoration this reverence that they get from people, they're, they're popular, they're famous, they're, their uh, opinions are valued, you know, like even if they are totally ignorant about most things. I mean, you have all these celebrities, they, 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 their word and their, their name and their, their sort of brand, their persona, it carry, carries so much weight and it, it's so, based, so sort of effective that they can get so much good done just from their, their name and their sort of face, face alone. And with this sort of sort of recognition, this sort of respect, this sort of uh, you would say uh, honor in the in the dunya, why is it that they can't find any satisfaction? Why is it that they can't find any peace or lasting happiness? And, and why is it that actually uh, stuff you would imagine a nice car, a nice house would? I mean, if you think about it in that from that perspective, you'd imagine that that would make you feel happy, but. It really doesn't. It, it's sort of fleeting, uh, and I, 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 I'm reminded uh, by the mercy of Allah of the hadith of uh, our beloved Prophet والسلام, and I'll just paraphrase it, where he says, "If this, if the son of Adam had, a, is it a valley or a mountain full of gold? Mountain, I believe. Yeah, he would want another one, isn't it? Do you remember that hadith? Yeah, yes, yeah. So I'm not quoting it verbatim, and I wish I, I remembered all of the words correctly, but inshallah, maybe our 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 teacher Imam Abdul Basit can can remind us. Um, what do we what do we think about sort of what Islam ultimately says about about these things? First of all, we know that Islam uh, is a practical and, and realistic religion, and it sort of prepares us for these sort of uh, difficulties that we face in life. I mean, we know as as Muslims, we know that. Life is not supposed to be uh, all play and all enjoyment, and it's not supposed to be a bed of roses, as it were. So what that does is basically it puts us in the frame of mind. It gives us sort of paradigms. Uh, first, it arms us with knowledge that these sorts of difficulties are coming, and we're going to feel sad, we're going to feel depressed, we're going to face the trials of life. And it also, on top of that, it gives us the solutions to deal with those things. And now those the solutions sort of seem... If I mean, if you're not a believer, it would seem counterintuitive and, and sort of like, what is this? Seems too easy to be true or too good to be true. But I mean, this is the reality of the situation that uh, Islam prescribes uh, basically internalizing your 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 diffi- difficulties and sort of seeking the solution from within through turning to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and it does that by first of all giving us a proper conceptualization of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his, his attributes and his actions. And by, by this I'm referring to uh, uh, 
by him teaching us about himself in the Quran and also explaining to us the uh, the pillar of faith that we call al qadr which is the divine predestination and the proper understanding of this basically it sort of removes a lot of the worry from our 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 hearts uh, in sort of dealing with those things that happen to us in our environment that we can't really control and on top of that it gives you the actual solutions of uh, of dealing with these problems uh, the the one of the most really poignant examples and the most uh, the most reflective examples and probably you could say very deep example is the ayat ayah in surah, uh, surah ali imran where allah is uh, speaking about uh, the battle of uhud and the, he's he's talking about the believers who are complaining after they lost Oh, where did this where did this come from they the believers they couldn't believe that i mean where the where the where the muslims and they're the they're the disbelievers they're the mushrikeen how come we lost allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this fitna or this trial is tribulation this despair that what you're feeling this is from yourselves because what what did you do you didn't obey allah and his messenger and that's the that's the ultimate sort of cure for our our problems ultimately is that we turn to allah in his obedience and we sort of basically take stock of ourselves. Whenever something bad happens to us, the first reaction of a Muslim should be basically, what did I do wrong to deserve this? Yeah? And we hope that our, our teacher can sort of explain that a little bit further. So basically it's two, it's two as aspects. You get the proper paradigms and the proper solutions in Islam. Uh, and the final thing is that, I mean, just, just uh, in matters where sort of we have to make choices between one thing or the other, and we we find that we make we t we might take a decision and we don't know, oh did I make the right decision? Did I you know did I buy this a sneaker? I mean was it a waste of money? Did I do I need it? Th things of that nature, things that are, might seem mundane, but they sort of weigh on our weigh on our hearts. We might worry about uh, these little things that happen in our lives. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, teaches us the dua of al istikhara when we have to make decisions between doing doing things, uh, doing uh, p uh, sort of making choices between one option or another, uh, that reminds me as well because we have a a lot of a lot of us. I would even say some Muslims are affected by this thing of like being superstitious or having bad omens. And you you mentioned istikhara, r remind me because the istikhara is the this is when we decide to do something or not do something. It, you know, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us this istikhara. So and since we're talking about life and trials of life, some people are, are really affected by this kind of you know bad omens. Where, for example, they, they they get up they get up in the morning to go to work. They walk outside. They they see a car crash in front of them. They're like, oh man, this is going to be a bad day. Look, yeah, this is a sign. I'm going to go back home. Which obviously this you know this comes as falls under minor shirk because you're kind of put you know you're basing what's going to happen upon an event rather than upon Allah so and a lot of people fall into that and mm -hmm. I mean it's it is some to some extent it's natural I believe it was uh, I can't remember if it's Ibn Abbas or now or Umar anhu. one of the one of the one of Sahaba said that um, there were none of us except that we are affected by this I mean all of us will sometime the, the shaitan or our weakness will start to you know oh that happened could it be bad but then you know the one, the correct one, is the one who says, "Come on, stuff Allah, that's nonsense," and they just, you know, they continue out the front door. They don't go back in. Mm. So you just remind me on that because a lot of people, they look for these kind of things in their life. You know, mm. uh, this th this bad thing happened today. You know, maybe there was a plane crash. Oh, I'm not going to go on a plane today. Today's a bad day for flying. Mm. For example, a, you know, a lot of, and we all those stupid superstitions like walking under a ladder and breaking a mirror. But surprisingly. Some people, uh, especially don't forget there's a lot of viewers out there who are living in the West. Some of them may have become Muslim recently. So a lot of these things have been drummed in them, you know. In Even the ones who are Muslim, but they may have not been practicing. or A lot of these things are drummed into their heads from when they're at school. or when they're, So sometimes you'll, you'll be surprised. They may actually stop. I broke a mirror. What's the, you know, they, they may have for a second have that split second fear. Then realize, well, you know. So it's important to mention that as well. Mm. I mean, it's common in uh, in uh, the Muslim countries as well, where you'd find a lot of superstitions that uh, uh, that sort of creep in from I don't know from the culture or from mingling with other cultures. They sort of they sort of creep in. For example, I mean, if you if you if you go to a country, uh, 
where uh, the, there is a significant uh, non-Muslim population, you'll find that aspects of the, uh, the culture sort of, uh, sort of mingle, especially when there's a lot of ignorance spread. And ultimately, uh, you'll, you'll find sort of sometimes even pagan sort of practices and, and, and superstitions creeping into, uh, creeping into uh, the practices and understanding of, of, the, of the Muslim community there. And I speak from experience because in my country there's a lot of sort of superstition uh, that creeps into the mindset of the, the Muslims in, in wh where I'm from as well. And uh, the only solution to that is, ed is education. And it brings us back to the point where we have to sort of teach people and give them, uh, and teach people to first conceptualize Allah properly and understand what are his what are his rights <clears throat> what are his rights upon us what are our his rights upon him what are his actions related to his slaves and what are his actions related to for example his uh, his his uh, his other creations his uh, his actions of the konia as it were the cosmic sort of order and i i wanted to re sort of reiterate the point that basically our mindset has to be what did we what did we do wrong and you this you you can find that in uh, numerous examples among among the sahaba and i think uh, maybe we have to take a that's break that's right yeah yeah we're <laughs> going we to go for we're going to go for a break inshallah uh, we'd like to before we go to break remind the viewers to please send us any messages any comments you can come on the on the facebook page time to please allah facebook page and please do give us a call as well for many of those viewers out there give us a call inshallah and we'll have some great guests inshallah after this break Please Allah, I will spend on you, he said. alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back our dear, to our dear viewers. And uh, we're back from our break. We were just talking about uh, the trials of life, uh, how, they're, how they're inevitable. We were talking about how we're supposed to sort of deal with uh, these trials uh, from a Muslim perspective. And on that note, I'd like to welcome our uh, our guests, uh, Al Imam, and our teacher Sheikh Abdul Basit Al Arkani, who is uh, who is an Imam here in Dubai, and uh, our brother Yusuf was vis visiting us from 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 Ireland. Assalamu alaikum wa So, uh, uh, brothers, if you could just maybe maybe elaborate uh, on what we've been talking about. We were we were we we when we went to break, we were talking about. <coughs> the sort of mindset of the companions when they were faced with uh, when they were faced with difficulties and i was about to sort of narrate this hadith from uh, from thawbah and it's narrated in uh, sunan abi dawood where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says uh, the people will soon summon one another to attack you as people when in, when eating invite others to share their dish and one of the sahaba asked Will that be because of our small numbers at that time? And I just wanted to point out this fact that their immediate sort of reaction was, what what did they do wrong? Is it because of something something from from their end that 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 this sort of problem happened? Uh, and then he goes, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam goes on to say, No, you will be numerous at that time, but you will be scum and rubbish like that carried down by a torrent. And then it goes on to, to finish the hadith. So if you could maybe sort of explain what this hadith means and how it relates to our, our topic, we'd, uh, we'd, be, we'd be appreciative. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ala ashabihi ajma'in. This is one of the authentic hadith on which we should especially ponder on this era when we are literally suffering from all the weaknesses about which the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke. And you can see in this hadith that the companions, Radwanullahi alayhim, they immediately thought about the physical weakness of which they may suffer at that time, when people be attacking them and troubling them. But the problem which the Prophet ﷺ pointed towards is not a physical weakness, it was a spiritual weakness. Here is the challenge for the Muslims too. It's not always a physical thing about which we can easily think, which is creating a problem for us. In many cases, it is a spiritual thing, like they say there's a defect in Iman, there's a defect in Aqeedah, 
There's a defect in your relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's something which you are not practicing properly of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Due to that, due to which maybe some are not maintaining the certain rulings which are obligatory on the Muslims to maintain. Due to these, you know, weaknesses and shortcomings which are found, a major calamity can come and afflict every single person in the, in the entire community. This is what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was speaking. There are cases in which, due to some physical mistakes, you, which you can see, literally you can see that this is the mistake. Like in the Battle of Uhud, there was something which all the companions saw, that there were some people who didn't maintain the locations which were assigned for them. But on the other case, there are, there are, there are, there are times when people are making, like for instance, they make things in their houses, or they make things in their hearts, for which there should be some istighfar. For which be the, there would be some repentance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can see in Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us two amnesties against problems of life, against the challenges of life. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ This is the first amnesty. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never punish them as long as you, O Messenger, you are between them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never punish them as long as they are making istighfar. Because istighfar is like cleaning the inner defects which a person, you know, makes between himself and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once he is cleansed, once he is cleaned uh, by the matter of istighfar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove that tribulation which was... Uh, from which he was struggling or from which he was suffering and that would be a uh, like restoring relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once you restore relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then you deserve all the rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, uh, brother Yusuf uh, you know we find a lot of times that uh, you get a question either it'll be from a non-muslim or it from be from a young muslim who's having sort of a crisis of faith or whatever They'll say, for example, if, uh, if God existed, how come there is so much evil and suffering in the world? Uh, how, how would we sort of answer that question? Because that sort of ties in to our conceptualizing God Almighty as well as understanding about uh, predestination. So if you could maybe uh, give some advice about that. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. So. Just before I answer that question, I just want to touch on something that uh, Sheikh Abdul Basri mentioned. Was that we, in, especially in the West, and you also mentioned about some of the actors um, who've taken their life and so on, and they live this kind of um, this lifestyle of wealth and glamour and so on, but they end their lives in such a such a very sad manner. And it's very important also to realize that in that aspect is that sometimes there are medical conditions that. They're not necessarily related to religion. Of course, religion is, is a very important part of, of life, it's the most important part. But sometimes it's not the religion that is the problem. Sometimes they need the medical care, they need the advice from, from, from the practitioner and from the doctor and, and so on. And um, also, in terms of the physical pain of the body, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that when any of our organs are not functioning properly, then you notice that we feel the pain instantly. So you might find somebody who has a problem with the liver, they might have hepatitis and so on, they immediately know, and this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're the pains that we have when we go and we seek some sort of a treatment for them. But also then you have, like the, like the Shaykh mentions, is, that the, is, is the pain of the heart. When the body doesn't know its function, why it is here, what, where am I going? We were traveling here today, we took some wrong turns, and we were a bit stressed because we didn't know where we were going. It's a bit like when you're on the, on the path and you don't know, you don't know where your destination is. Similar to the human being, if he doesn't know his destination, he doesn't know where he's going to end up, what's going to happen to him after his death, and these trouble the human being. And this is a very important thing. But alhamdulillah, in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, in the deen and Allah al-Islam, very the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. The question that you mentioned, uh, Burn Nabil, about this misconception that a lot of non-Muslims have about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First of all, we have to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells about himself in the Quran, Inna Allah la yadlimun nasa shay'a. Verily Allah does not do injustice to anybody. And nas here is everybody, non-Muslims and Muslims alone. Sometimes we perceive things 
to be evil. Sometimes we perceive them to, to, to be bad, but in essence they're not bad. Sometimes they're there to wake people up, to guide people back to the right path. And that's what happens when you have a physical ailment. What do you do? You pursue a doctor. You go to someone who's going to help you. But the physical and the, sp the spiritual ailments of the heart, then what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to do? He's trying to take you from that troubled lifestyle and bring you back onto the right path. We have to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in the Quran, in many verses, that don't think that what the volume and what they're doing, the oppressors, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to leave them. Verily, He's delaying them until, until an appointed time. And anything that happens, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِنْ مُصِيبَةٍ فِيمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْهُمْ كَثِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that no musibah, no trial or calamity happens except it's what your hands has put forward. In other words, in the actions that you've done within your limbs, the evil deeds that you do in your life and so on, and the lifestyle that you choose to do. But Allah pardons so much. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in other verse, at the end of Surah Fatir, that if... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, was to actually bring us to account to, to all the things that we do. He would not leave anybody on the earth. In other words, you know, because of the injustice that we're doing to ourselves. And also the Prophet used to always make dua at the beginning and used to say at the beginning of his khutbahs, نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُورِ أَنفُسِنَا وَمِنْ سَيِّئَاتِ أَعْمَالِنَا We seek refuge in the evil of ourselves and the evil consequences of okay. our evil actions. So, we have to understand is that our acts, anything that we do, has a transitive effect. Sometimes we think, well, okay, these people, like the Sheikh mentioned that, okay, they're giving it so far, these people are doing well, but you find that sometimes there's a musibah or a calamity, another part of the Muslim world. But we cannot look at us like as different identity. We are one ummah. So my sins affect you, your sins affect me, and we are all affected by each other. And that's when we're talking about Uhud, and then the, the, how the companions, they, they went against the Prophet Sallallahu in that issue, and therefore they suffered a defeat. It's a lesson for us that even when the Prophet Sallallahu was there, that they had to suffer defeat. That's a lesson for us for, from the seerah. Um, so it depends, obviously, uh, Abu Nabil, who we're talking about in terms of the non-Muslims. Because Christians, for example, have a concept that God is all good. And nothing comes except for good from, all, for, from, from God. So when evil happens, they can't explain it. And this, is, this, is, this can be a problem because it all goes back to the concept of, of, of who God is. Um, but we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed the shirt to happen is he, it's, a, he, it's his qadr and we have to be patient upon that what Allah has destined and patience upon his obedience patience upon abstaining from those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to keep away from and also patience on things such as the qadr the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we learn loads of lessons in the Quran that's what the NBA and all the prophets went through was tribulations and trials and Allah tells us to go back on the Qur'an. Quran. Do you not reflect upon the Qur'an? Reflecting on what? On those stories of the prophets who went through bigger trials than any of us face to give us what? That type of reassurance, that type of tranquility. And how do we respond to those sort of calamities? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think the patience is obviously a very important part of it. The whole, the whole patience. I mean, even, you know, you have the verse where Allah says, uh, yeah. You know, like we will test you with uh, fear and hunger and taking away of thamarat, uh, like uh, you know, possessions and etc., and give glad tidings to those who are patient. So I think the patience, obviously, is very important in this whole trials of life. I mean, Sheikh Abdul Basit, maybe you can mention to us some of the, the other ayat and the ahadith and, and the maybe examples of patience because a lot of people you know they think that the problems they're going through may be the biggest problems ever no one's had to deal with things like i can and i can no longer handle it so maybe a lot of people can relate to these examples of patience and how allah loves so allah says you know he loves those <coughs> who are who are patient it's actually the matter of aqidah and iman our aqeed and our iman teaches us that when you are in a problem, you should have patience instead of arguing and rejecting the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the person who has given, who has taught a proper aqeedah from his childhood, from his youth, such a person will not suffer from these problems because he knows that life means two things, either to be patient or to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in the Qur'an, in the lives of the messenger 
or in the lives of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were messengers who were rulers and kings. So they were grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sulaiman alayhi salam says, Rabbi awzi'ni and ashkura ni'matak. Oh Allah, assist me so that I can thank your favors upon me. Because he is now enjoying many things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, on the other side you have Ayyub alayhi salam, and Ibrahim alayhi salam, tested in different ways. And these are, these are being rewarded by Allah again as Sulaiman is being rewarded. Because these people are patient and those people are, or those, uh, that Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the matter of aqeedah. We have to learn or we have to teach ourselves, our children from the beginning that life means there should be a trial. There should be trials, there should be tribulations. Our faith says to us that there is, the, uh, the, there is no iman without tribulations. This life was granted to us for tribulations. And what, uh, the scholars of Aqidah, they speak about something very interesting. They say <coughs> one of the requirements of your faith is tribulation. And one of the requirements of, your tri of tribulations in life is sabr. How, you, how can you display your sabr? to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can you display your love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Your sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When, when you are not being given a chance to be tested. So when you are being tested, at that time when you show that you are, you are accepting what, what Allah is deciding for you, and you are very patient in that matter, that, that is when you are showing your love, your loyalty for your faithfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who do that, those who have the ability to do that by showing patience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sincerity to Allah, loyalty to Allah, maintaining a good relation with Allah, blaming, blaming themselves only, these people are rewarded always. And as you mentioned, the Quran always speaks about the rewards of those who are patient. إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ That the, those who are patient, they are rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any limit. Limit, uh, one of our scholars like Ibn Qudam and Minhaj al-Salikin says, Minhaj al qasadin says, most of the areas or most of the rewards which are mentioned in the Quran by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are connected with patience. Unless you have patience, you won't be able to get to that place which Allah promised you. You want a higher level in Jannah, where is your patience? You want to be successful in this life, where is your patience? وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَيْمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا Allah says about Bani Israel in Surah Sajda in the end of the Surah. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا That we made them, we raised them as imams, as leaders. But when did Allah raise them as leaders? لَمَّا صَبَرُوا When they were found patient. وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ And they're having a firm faith in our science. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his life, he gave us many examples. He said in one of the wonderful hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that a believer is not afflicted with a concern or a problem or even the pricking of a thorn except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises him and erases his sins. So these are the rewards which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions for the patient people who are accepting this not because they don't have any other option. They are doing it because they want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward them. They are doing yeah. it sincerely. The remainder of the, the verse that I quoted, which went, uh, the last part of it was Wabashir Sabarin. If I remember correctly, he said it continues to say Alladina Ida Asabat Hum Masidun Kalu inna Lillahi wa inna ilay inna ilahi rajun Ula ika alayhim sarawatum in Rabbihim Warahma. That those people that were he mentions, you know, give glad tidings to the those who are patients, the one that if they are affected, they say, Indeed to Allah we came, indeed we return. And then it says, Indeed, for those people there are salutations and the mercy of Allah is upon them. So that's just another sign of the kind of reward of being patient. Definitely, definitely. So the rewards of those who are patient is, uh, is limitless. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in an authentic hadith narrated in Sahihain that ma yusibu al-mu'mina bin darra'in fasabara أو يصيب سراء فشكر فكان خيرا له. That a believer is not afflicted by a by a calamity and he is found patient and when he's when he is blessed by a favor of Allah subhanahu wa taala and he is found grateful, that is better for him. Now the difference between a faithful person, a man of iman, a man of good aqidah, and a normal person or a person who doesn't know what's iman, what's aqidah, 
oh, what's faith? What, how, what does that mean to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that a man who's having faith, he knows how to deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows what is the station of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what is his station in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While a person who doesn't know what does God mean, what, what are they, what, what, what Allah, what's the station of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, such a person doesn't know. So immediately when he's afflicted by a problem, he will say, what did I do? Why should I, why is it me always? Why is it my children? Why is my family? Why my car? And so on and so forth. On the other hand, the believer will say, there might be some defect in me. It's either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala erasing my sins or raising me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, if you see the uh, Islamic history, for instance, the most people who suffered are the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then those who were close to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how much he suffered? His children died. He was turned out of his city. And the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in one of the occasions, he says, I saw in my dream, I dreamt that my sword is having a crack. And I saw also that some cows are being slaughtered in front of me. The companion said to the Messenger وسلم, How did you interpret this, this dream? And he says, the interpretation of this dream that the crack in my sword means one of my close members of my family will die, will be martyred in the battle of Rafat. And cows being slaughtered means that some of my close companions will die in this battle. So these are calamities from which the Messenger وسلم, is suffering. Yet he is grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshipping Allah throughout night. Not saying why is it... That's the difference between a believer and a disbeliever. Here, now the, where do we get the training from? We get the training by living with the believers. There are many cases we don't give good example or good, uh, good environments to ourselves, to our children, to those whom we love and care about. And then they end up asking questions of this kind. Because they didn't get the proper tarbiyah. The tarbiyah is tarbiyah ibadiyah. You have to give them a proper tarbiyah from childhood. That this is iman. Iman means there will be trials. Tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulku. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Alladhi khalaq al-mawta wal-hayata. Ya mulukum. Allah created life and death to test you. And this test is a good thing for us. In what sense? That we, everybody claims that he loves Allah. That he is sincere to Allah. Now the test will show how sincere you are. If you are really sincere, you will accept the test and in this tribulation you will find yourself patient because you want to accept this test and the, the, the more you accept it, the more you are patient, the higher you go and the higher level in Jannah you will deserve. Allah also says uh, in the Quran, and I'm not trying to sort of put you on the spot here, He says, uh, So how do we sort of reconcile this uh, ayah and the ayah saying that of course, we're going to be tested. Is this uh, this play and amusement? Is that part of the test as well, or is that uh, some sort of? Uh, this is a very important answer, uh, question, uh, which basic <coughs> in which the uh, the verse itself is actually is giving us a definition for this life, for this world. It is saying to us that you, as human beings, as believers, you are higher. You are a creature who, which is who is considered to be a higher being than wasting your time in these things then considering these things which is nothing except in the Malhaid except Laib and Lahu you are higher than these things you are created for a higher thing a human being is having three components every human being is having three components in him he's having an intellectual component his brain his mind and the physical component and the spiritual component faith comes here to serve the spiritual component and to put you away from your desires from the worldly things which may which may grab your attention and put you away from your destination from the way towards your heading so the 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 trial here is that this dunya in which you are living was made laibun and lahu it's a it's a place for amusement and play so if you are involved in those things you will miss your way why do we say this is Salat al Mustaqim, so Allah guide us to the straight path which is taking us to you in a proper way. Salat al Mustaqim is the shortest distance between, between two points. But if you will go towards amusement and play and other things which are there in the land, then you will miss Salat al Mustaqim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us both Salat al Mustaqim and Salat of this dunya. That if you will take this life or this dunya, you will miss Salat al Mustaqim and you won't be on the proper path. Mm. Well, it's, it's time for another break. So inshallah we'll go for a quick break and join us after the break. And remember, you can send us your messages, comments on the Facebook page or feel free inshallah to give us a call. Time to please Allah. 
chance to gain reward I will spend on you he said I will spend on you he said Assalamu alaikum and welcome back for the break. I mean, before we went for the break, mashallah, we discussed a lot about the the trials of life and the and we had some examples of how the how even the Prophet ﷺ of the kind of trials he went through and we we mentioned uh, uh, subhanallah we mentioned the uh, importance and the rewards of uh, rewards of sabr and I believe Nabil, before we went to the break, you had uh, you had started on the point. Actually, I, I was uh, sort of thinking about can we be, uh, you know, tested from the other aspect of thing, things, you know, because Allah can, you know, put us through difficulty, or He could put us through through ease as well. And uh, we mentioned uh, about uh, shukr and, and thankfulness, and I think that that situation, if you don't handle that ease correctly, you would be basically put in a fitna of easiness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you're not using those blessings that Allah gave you in the in the cor- in the correct way to be to be thankful to Allah. And I think uh, one of the definitions of shukr is that using the uh, blessings of Allah uh, in a way in uh, in a way that is only pleasing to Him and not using them in a way that is that is displeasing, displeasing to Him. Mm-hmm. The brother Yusuf he mentioned, you know, uh, that our sins affect other other people as well. I'm reminded <laughs> of. A story in the seerah of Umar ibn al-Khattab where there was an earthquake in Medina and he gathered the people and he started yelling at them. It's like, this earthquake is because of your sins and if this happens again, I'm going to leave Medina and not come back. And he was making, he was making a step forward. He was saying, astaghfirullah wa tu wilay, astaghfirullah wa tu wilay. So that's, I mean, I thought that was a, it was a very pertinent point. And we can sort of understand that, okay, we're believers. Um, we have a reward in the akhirah as well. And it's only understandable that we pay for that reward with some some so, some sort of you know effort and work in in the dunya. But what about what about those disbelievers who they don't have any reward in the in the akhirah? And Allah says in the Quran that they're rewarded in the dunya for what for whatever good that they do or whatever whatever they work they work they put in. But what about those situations where um, a disbeliever will basically live a really really difficult life and then he'll die upon disbelief? For example, you have some uh, some uh, non-Muslims where they live in very isolated uh, countries, you know, uh, very poor countries, and they live a very difficult, hard life, and then they die upon other other than Islam. So, how do we sort of reconcile those two things? Because that's another question that we get from you know people with faith crises and you know uh, the non-Muslims as well. You know, brother, you mentioned the point because there's so many very important points, and sometimes we gloss over without kind of dealing with any uh, even greater detail but just to briefly touch on the issue of a shukr and you mentioned that uh, and this is what the scholars have debated which is a greater trial to be afflicted with calamity and poverty um, and disease and so on or to be tested with wealth and luxury and so on which is a greater test and even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us you're going to test you in what in evil and in good, as what? As a trial, as a test. Mm-hmm. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ فِتْنَةً أَتَصْبِرُونَ وَكَانَ رَبُّكَ بُصِيرًا And we have made amongst you a trial from, from, from amongst each other. Um, and to be patient, verily your, your, your Lord is, is, is ever watchful over what you do. So the debate was, which is a greater uh, test? Is it to be patient or to be grateful? And some said, well, because patients are very few people are patient in those calamities because poverty is a terrible thing and disease and so on and war. It's very difficult to be patient in such situations. Some, they said, well, also being, you know, having so much wealth and so much opportunity to do so much with the money and so much evil, then it's very difficult. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَقَلِيلُ مِنْ عِبَادِي الشُّكُورِ Few of my slaves are shukur, are, are grateful. So this issue is, 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 is critical. Some scholars said that it's neither. Both are equally as difficult. And now we're sitting here in this nice beautiful studio with some water and tea and so on. And you know, we have the comforts and so on. Is our test here, is it greater than those who are in the Church of Muslim women who are suffering? We have a greater test. Why? Because our responsibility to those people, looking at those people, what are we going to do? Are we going to do anything to change their situation? Are we going to sit back? And, and, and look on that and, and let it happen. So we have a responsibility in that regard. 
we should learn, and this maybe touches on the question that you mentioned about the disbelievers, when they look at the suffering that they have and they see things that are evil and so on going around them, that we have to understand that it's all about perspective and perception of how we look at things. And the Prophet Sallallahu guide us to changing our perception by reading Surah Al-Kaf every Friday. And in the story of Musa and Khidr is a classic example of how what might outwardly appear to be evil and, and, and a calamity in a sense has a huge benefit and has a great um, uh, uh, a reminder from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. In what sense? Is that Musa was looking from the outward eye. He wasn't looking from the inward eye, as many of the scholars Tizkiyah mentioned. Is that he was looking from the surface at this, what Khidr was doing, such as um, destroying the boat and killing, killing the boy. Uh, these things on the surface look terrible. But Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala was teaching Musa Alayhi Salam that behind it there's a hikmah ilahiyah, mm. there's a divine wisdom behind everything. Mm. And although people might appear to be suffering and so on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like I always mention, and we always have to have a balance in how we, we look at things. Inna Allah la nas Allah does not do injustice to anybody. It's Allah wants people to be guided to the path, gives them opportunities. And how many non-Muslims became Muslims? How did they become Muslims? So many stories that we hear, and I'm, I'm sure Ismail uh, has, has, has heard quite a few over the years is that they had been trialed earlier through an accident or they had some difficulty and they gave a chance for them to reflect why am I here, what am I doing and so on and that was a chance Allah wanted to push them onto the right path so we have to always, it depends on how we look at things okay, it's all about perception, we can see and look at that person oh he's miskeen, he has nothing, he's, he's in a very bad environment so, but also remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests everybody in their, in their own circumstances you know people who are in luxury and, 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 and in wealth and so on are being tested differently and there are people who are poor and so will be tested differently and they'll be all tested based on their circumstances so we cannot do a blanket you know uh, you know we cover them obviously they're all going to be tested the same way no they'll be all tested and the Prophet ﷺ said that the mu'min will be tested hasbadini he'll be tested according to to his religion and if his religion if he's strong and his iman is strong then he'll be tested more so and if his iman is is weak and low then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala khuffif anhu he will he will be it'll be lightened on him so we have to look at things. It depends what perspective we're looking at. From an Islamic perspective, the situation is different. From a non-Muslim perspective, also the issue is different. But like I said before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His hikmah, Hu al-Hakim, Hu al-Khabir, He is the, the all-wise, the all-knowledgeable. And we, what we may perceive to be evil, in a sense, is, is good. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want evil for us. He wants to guide the people. You know, He wants people to go to Jannah. We have some kind of misconception certainly uh, finding some faiths and so on that you know there's, God is an angry God God wants to punish the people this is not the perception that we have for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anybody who reads the Quran from cover to cover will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wudud He is loving He wants the people to enter into the power but it's the people like in the nasa it's the people themselves they do oppression to themselves so this is a very important point to clarify I think and uh Allah also says in the Quran in, uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah in between in the in the ayahs of fasting he says uh, uh, Allah doesn't want from uh, Allah wants for you ease and he doesn't want for you for you hardship so in that situation why is he why does he test uh, why does he test his creation if he wants for us ease and he doesn't want for us hardship how do we sort of reconcile those two those two concepts this is a very important thing which answering which is very important because if it's left unanswered it may lead some people to atheism and why if God is merciful and He wants ease, why is He putting His creation into tribulations? We have to know that human being is a kind of being which is, if, it, if, if they are put in tribulations, then only they come out with good, good qualities. The, good, the human beings are created in a way, in a form that, in order to bring them to the proper place, in order to bring out the good qualities which are found in them, you have to put them in tribulation. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human beings. Like gold, for example, when you want to purify gold, you have to put it in fire so to purify it. So for us, you know, again it comes to the, the way in which we have a relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing that in order to bring the good which is found in us, bring them out. So that that's displayed. And there's a criterion between those who are working for Allah and those who are living only for this life. Just living for, like, for, for the luxuries of life. It's a cheap life actually, to live for the luxuries of life, which will soon, either it will go away, it will be broken, it will be removed, or you will be removed. One from the two things would going to happen. So if you live for, an, for something which is like um, staying for a short period of time, 
you are spending your life in a cheap way. While a person who is living for the one who is eternal, mm. for the eternal life, his life is valuable. Mm. He's giving value to his life. And that's what we have to know about ourselves in our relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the important things which you ask that, about those people who didn't, or those disbelievers or non-Muslims who are, who are suffering in this world, why should they not, or those non-Muslims, you said that they did some good things, something like this? Yeah, yeah okay, there's, obviously there's, for example, one, uh, one group of uh, non-Muslims, like the celebrities, they have everything in this life. And we know that they're rewarded, they, they get their reward in the dunya, and then in the akhirah they have nothing if they, if they die as, as non-Muslims, and, and they, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges them that way. But they have another group of non-Muslims, for example, in very poor parts of the world, where they live a very, very difficult life, you know, they don't have food, they have war, famine, all kind of, uh, all kind of problems. And they go through... The, they go through these trials okay, of, of extreme difficulty and they die upon other than Islam. So they have no dunya and no akhirah either, technically speaking. Obviously, uh, Allah is the one who judges. This could be the worst condition where a person is neither having dunya nor akhirah. As a principle, we believe that for our deeds to be accepted or for us to be accepted in Jannah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the condition mm. is Islam. Allah says, this is a principle mentioned in the Quran. He who seeks a religion else than Islam, it will not be accepted from him. But we have to know here that in many cases, when we speak about those people who are living in far away remote places of this world, in many cases they didn't even hear about Islam. Mm. The question which we should ask ourselves as Muslims, what did we do to mm. convey the message of Islam to them? And do we think that we are not responsible for that in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? See how hard the Messenger Sallallahu was while being in Medina at that time when they don't have these transportations and all those things, all those means. He would send messengers all the way to Persia, means a journey of two months. Mm. All the way to Sham, a journey of two months. All the way to Yemen, in order to convey the message. How much are we doing today? But we still believe in Allah's mercy that those people who didn't hear about Islam, Allah may give them the station of people of Fatra. That they never heard about Islam. They never had, nobody conveyed the proper. Even some scholars of Aqidah they even say if the message of Islam was conveyed to a person in a wrong manner, he's still a man of fatra. Because nobody conveyed the proper message of Islam to the man. Allah is merciful. For such people, they might be a test in Akhirah. And if they qualify their test, then Allah will judge make a judgment for them. Well and even just as last point, Asma, is very important that even if like some of the people we mentioned that they pass away and we know that they didn't die in Islam, it's still not allowed for us to speak about individual people, mm. about their condition. And a lot of people have to be very careful of that. Sometimes mm. we see in Facebook and people reacting, exactly. oh, you know, he did this against the Muslims and so on. Okay, but his affairs with Allah, and it's not allowed for us as Muslims to speak about specific people. Mm. His fish issue is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we should remain silent on that. Of course, we have the general things that mm -hmm. the brother yeah. mentioned, but specific cases are not allowed for us to speak about that. And that yeah. reminds me, I mean, we're about to completely finish now, but just for those people who have heard that point and said, oh, who, wow, what, when? I remember hearing that in the explanation of uh, Sheikh al Uthaymeen, of the explanation of the Aqeed of Ahl sunnah where he elaborated on that whole point that we are not allowed to, even if we know that person was a non-Muslim, we cannot say for sure, all Muslim, he's going to Jannah, he's going to Jahannam. And we've really kind of overstepped our limit by a couple of minutes. But Jazakallah Khair for both of you coming on. And we hope whenever Yus is back in town from Ireland, we can have him over here on the studio. So You're welcome really bad, to come to Ireland, really inshallah. Irish, <laughs> my really bad Irish impression there. And inshallah, Imam of the Basits. Uh, Muqeem here, so inshallah he'll come on more inshallah. Exactly. And Jazakallah Khair for the uh, viewers again. And for Brother Nabil Aziz, uh, I think next week will be Brother Gabriel will be back back in town inshallah. So, so where are you going? You're going to England now for one month? Or no, what? no, I'm, I'm here inshallah. I'll be, I'll be around inshallah. <laughs> so Jazakallah Khair for watching inshallah and join us inshallah. Bismillah, same time, same place here on Huda TV. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Time to please Allah. A chance to gain reward I will spend on you, he says All on who spend in good cause Good deeds are opportunities Sparkling bright and true Raising you in the sight of Allah And adorning Al-Jannah for you 
So rush to earn his reward. Don't forget the oppressed.